So who's the biggest group of investors that invests in investment trust these days? Is it private investors? Is it professionals? Is it institutional? So the only people who invest in trust now, broadly speaking, with some exceptions, private investors and what we call wealth managers, which you perhaps can describe as old fashioned stockbrokers who now call themselves wealth managers, <laughs> not always correctly. <laughs> so these are firms that actually manage private client money. They like investment trusts because they also know that they are actually very good vehicles for getting access to things. We have seen some very interesting newcomers come to the market and then now about half the investment trusts that are out there are alternative assets. So that's private equity, commercial property, renewable energy, I mentioned infrastructure. We have a, a couple of funds that invest in music royalties. We have shipping, a couple of shipping investment trusts and so on. And they become more and more popular because mainly because they've been selling on dividend yield yeah. ground. They've been offering between five, six, 7% per annum with a prospect of some additional capital growth as well, which is obviously much better than the bank account has been or government bonds have been. Yeah until this year anyway. Hello and welcome to the Fund Retirement Podcast, a guest-led podcast aimed at sharing insights and strategies that help you build long-term wealth. Today I'm delighted to introduce Jonathan Davis. Jonathan is the founder and host of Moneymakers, a weekly podcast show dedicated exclusively to following the latest news and developments in the investment trust sector. Jonathan is a private investor and has been writing about the financial markets for over four decades for some of the major national publications, such as The Times, The Economist, The Independent and The Financial Times. Jonathan is also a published author, authoring the very popular and successful book, The Investment Trust Handbook, which is now on its sixth edition. Jonathan's main interests are big picture investment issues, asset allocation, strategy and investment trust fund selection. Hello, Jonathan. Thank you very much for joining us today. Appreciate you coming on the show. It's a pleasure to be here, Lee. Thank you for inviting me. So I'd like all the guests to start with a little bit about their investing journey and their background. What was the catalyst that got you started then on your investing journey? Genuinely, just curiosity, really. I started my career as a financial journalist, as a journalist, I beg your pardon, on local newspapers. You had to do that back in the day. Before you could work on the national newspapers, you had to go and do a couple of years training on the local newspapers, which I did. It was back in the 1970s, the bad old days of the 1970s, when there were a lot of strikes on. Quite by ill chance, I was called out on strike a couple of times during my first couple of years. So I was having to learn something and get better, do my training. And uh, it turned out that actually I spent all the time on, on strike or being called out on strike back in the day. Of, it was a ridiculous thing, really absurd. <laughs> I wasn't happy at all. So anyway, when the, I got a chance to get a job in, on the national newspaper, and the only one that was offered to me was, at that point, was in the uh, city office of the Sunday Telegraph which was then quite a well-known financial sector. And of course, at that time, I knew absolutely nothing about the stock market or anything like that. And I professionally, I had to start to learn about it. I went off and re-educated myself for a year at T, which is a big American university. And then I came back and then I just developed from there. So it was a kind of a combination of not just curiosity, but also professional necessity. How long ago was that, by the way, if you don't mind me asking? Well, a long time ago, I'm sorry to say. I left university in 1975. It's a long time ago. <laughs> so you've been involved in, in, in and around finance for quite some time then, quite a number of decades, in fact. A number of decades, yes. <laughs> uh, that, that actually is quite important because whatever you can learn about the financial markets, there's nothing quite like experience to, to keep you on the straight and narrow. And I think that's one of the lessons I've learned over the, over the years is that it's so useful not only having a kind of theoretical background, and, but having so much experience to actually know what really happens when when things get tough or when they, things go well yeah it's uh, been a long time but still great fun the other great thing about the stock market at least is that uh, every day is a new day and there's uh, there's always new stuff to be uh, trying to get your head around so it's it's fascinating so yeah. i'm happy still doing it brilliant i know you have a broad spectrum of understanding of the stock market but you particularly focus on investment trusts and in your book the investment trust handbook i quote Investment trusts were once called the city's best kept secret, but are now increasingly becoming popular with private investors. So would you mind sharing with the audience, what are investment trusts? Okay. What is an investment trust? Investment trust is a listed company. So it's a public company, just a BP or Shell or Lloyd's, Barclays, I don't know. Anything. But it, with the difference that instead of having a, a business like banking or oil production, it's an investment vehicle. So it's a publicly listed investment vehicle, which is subject to all the laws and regulations that surround the public listed companies. And basically they invest in mainly in other securities, but also in unlisted assets like property and things like that. So it's a kind of hybrid vehicle. 
the normal contrast is with unit trusts or open-ended or OICs, as they're now called, open-ended investment companies, which became very popular from the 60s onwards. For retail investors, they offer them an easy way into the market. And investment trusts do the same job, but they're slightly more complicated and slightly more sophisticated. You have to do a little more research before you can really understand them. And that's why they were called the city's best kept secret, because they were deemed to be too complicated for most people to understand. And therefore it was only the professionals in the city who knew that they were on average, a superior vehicle to an OIC or a, a unit trust. So what's the difference between trusts and funds then? One is obviously that, as I said, it's a publicly listed company, which means that they have a board of directors, which is accountable to shareholders. They're subject to stock exchange listing rules, and they're also subject to a corporate governance requirements and the Companies Act, in fact, which regulates how companies behave. So that gives confidence to shareholders that they are going to be well managed on the whole. Unit trusts are slightly different because they're not listed companies. They are basically run by a fund management company who issues you a unit in a fund. Uh, and you can redeem it every day. You can redeem, you can redeem your units and the price is always the net asset value. In other words, what the value of the investments in a unit trust is the price you will get if you buy or sell them with, with investment trust, it's different because they have shares, they have shares which are traded on the stock market, like other kinds of companies, as I've said, uh, and those shares don't always necessarily uh, match the net asset value. So you have this concept of the discount or the premium. And that's one of the things which you have to understand if you're investing in investment trust, that even though the company publishes every day, or most of them publish every day, their net asset value, what the assets are worth, what you will pay or what you will receive if you buy or sell them is not necessarily exactly that amount. That's basically the main difference. Different regulations, different protections for the investors. And they also have the advantage that they can invest in a much wider range of assets than unit trusts because of their, what's called the closed end structure. I said they're superior vehicle. That's what I believe. That's what most people who invest in them believe. If you, it's very difficult to actually establish that beyond all doubt that they produce better performance. But if you compare, for example, a, an investment trust that invests in UK stocks and shares with a unit equivalent, a unit trust, on average, the investment trust will produce a higher return over time on average. And it's a little disputed that, that conclusion, but that's what everybody who invests in them certainly believes. The other difference that I haven't mentioned so far is that in principle, at least, though in practice, not quite as clear cut as this, in principle, at least the number of shares in an investment trust is fixed. Right. So it's, there, it's subject therefore to supply and demand. If more investors want to buy that trust, then, then they want to sell it. The shares may actually change hands above the net asset value. That's what we call selling at a premium. The way that the, uh, the trust grows because the number of shares is fixed. It's if there's uh, more demand for those shares or the, if the assets do well, the share price goes up accordingly in a kind of relationship with that. With, with unit trusts, it's not quite, quite the same, but they both basically invest in a range of different assets. You're quite right. And when the value of those assets goes up, the share price goes up or the unit price goes up. Yeah. Uh, the difference being that investment trusts can invest in, in what we call illiquid investments. In other words, things like property, which individual investors can't just go out and buy a factory or whatever this is. They have to buy it through a, a collective vehicle, like an investment trust. An investment trust can do that. It's much easier for them to do that than it is for a unit trust to do that. Are these trusts actively managed then by managers who select the investments to invest in? Yes. Basically what happens is the formal process is that the board of directors typically will appoint a fund manager to manage the assets in the style and the objective that the shareholders already approve. So they have to be a prospectus. When you start an investment trust, there's a prospectus, a legal document that says, this is what we're going to do. And that is binding on the company. Uh, you can change it later, but the board of directors is responsible to the shareholders for making sure that is what that investment trust does. And typically they will appoint an external fund manager to manage the assets for them. Typically with a unit trust though, it's the same company that actually sets up the unit trust and runs it and is responsible for managing it in, in the style that they said they're going to manage it. So yeah. just as with the unit trust, the, the fund manager charges a fee for managing the assets. And if the trust does incredibly well, then, then the, uh, the fund manager will do incredibly well. If they grew the size of the trust to the same size as Terry Smith's Fundsmith equity fund, which has got up to around 20 billion, they're going to make an awful lot of money every year, just as Terry Smith has done. Yeah. But uh, I should mention also though, that the investment trust on average, the fees that they charge are slightly lower than, than the average actively managed unit trust. They're not passive vehicles or tracker funds as we call them. They're, they are cheap. Yeah, I was going to touch on fees and so in comparison to funds, what are the fees? Broadly in the same ballpark, I'd say broadly in the same ballpark, but on average, as far as one can tell from the evidence, they're slightly cheaper. The great advantage is that the board being responsible to shareholders 
uh, one of its things it's responsible for is making sure that the fees are competitive and good value. Yeah. Whereas in a unit trust, that doesn't really apply because there is a conflict of interest. The company that's actually issuing the unit trust and running it has an interest in maximizing the amount of fee they get out of it. So there's no kind of oversight on that. It's just buyer beware. The board of directors of an investment trust does have that responsibility. And that's one reason why we do see quite often fees have been coming down in the last few years. They've been reduced. And they've also, a lot of trusts have introduced what we call tiered fees so that the bigger the trust becomes, the lower the rate at which they charge their fees. That is a definite, that is a definite advantage to investment trusts. So when you're investing in trusts, what's your primary objective then? Is it the growth of the underlying assets or is it the, perhaps the dividend income? Yeah, basically there's something for everybody in the investment trust world. There's a, there's a whole range of different types of investment you can invest in. When they started, these investment trusts go back to the 19th century when they first started. And in those days, they were set up in order to allow UK investors or British investors to invest in overseas investments, typically in bonds issued by railway companies and things back in the 19th century, so for diversification. Then they all moved into investing in stocks and shares, equities, and that was the norm for a long time. But they can invest in anything. And more recently, we've seen a whole range of different types of investment trust start. So some of them are designed and set out to tell the investors that they want to provide an income, mainly, primarily, and others offer you potential for mainly or exclusively capital growth. Okay. So there's a whole spectrum from trusts that pay no dividends at all to those whose main selling point is that they only provide a dividend essentially. So where do you find these types of trusts then? Are they just listed on the London Stock Exchange? Yep, they're listed on the London Stock Exchange. You can look up the share price just like anybody else. If you're on a platform like Hargreaves Lansdowne or Interactive Invest or any of these a retail platforms that have come to the fore in the last few years, which has been very helpful. Yeah, you can look up the price at any point at any time during the trading day, and they will be quoting a price. So you can see what it is very simply these days. When you're looking for an investment trust then, what type of metrics are you looking for to signal to you that this is a good buy? You mentioned the discount rate earlier on. Would you mind expanding on what the discount rate is and what are the metrics you look for when you're looking to make an investment into an investment trust? Okay, so this is quite a big subject in the sense that this is what the whole the whole game is all about. <laughs> yeah, this is the meat of it, isn't it? <laughs> this is the meat of it. The sensible way to think about it is you have to start with what are you trying to achieve? Always, what are you trying to achieve? So there's no point if you're interested in a reliable income stream, there's no point in looking at a trust that doesn't pay an income. It's just plain yeah. obvious. Yeah. So you have to do your kind of research and look at the various metrics of, of each individual investor trust. What does it aim to do? How well has it performed? Has it actually delivered on what it said it was hoping to do? Has it beaten its benchmark? Most investment trusts have a benchmark they compare themselves to. Yeah. Uh, has it done well against that over time? That's important. You have to look at who's on the board. Have they got a very impressive board of people who at least sound like they, they know what they're doing? Who is the fund manager? Has he got a track record? You have to look at that as well. How long has he been doing it? How does the performance of the investment trust, if there's an equivalent unit trust, and quite often the same fund manager will be managing both an investment trust and an open-ended trust at the same time mm. for different audiences. How do these two compare? And then you have to look at two other things, which I mentioned. Number one, I haven't mentioned so far is the fact that another difference between investment trusts and open-ended funds is that investment trusts can borrow money to enhance returns. Uh -huh. So that's what we call that gearing. Yeah. The idea being that if you borrow some money and whatever you're investing goes up in value, then the gearing and the effect of that is you're, you're paying interest on a loan essentially. But the effect of that is if the return is greater than the interest you're paying on the loan, the value of the trust will go up more than it would do if there was no gearing. Yeah. Works the other way. If, if, yeah. It works the other way. If they <laughs> down, it works against them. And not all investor trusts have gearing or use that power to borrow, but it is a way in which they can also enhance returns hmm. over time. So that's one thing. And then the second thing is this discount, which I mentioned already. Here's the question. If you can buy shares in a trust for say 90p in the NAV, the reported net asset value is a pound on the face of it, getting a bargain. Yes. Okay. <laughs> on the face of it, you're getting a bargain, but unfortunately it's not quite as simple as that. And similarly, if you're paying one pound 10 for an investment trust, which has a stated net asset value of a pound, you're paying over the odds, if yeah. you like, on the face of it. But it's a lot more complicated than that. There may be reasons why an investment trust is trading at a discount or a premium. For example, some of the investment trusts that invest in property or in renewable energy or shipping or things that have recently come to the, become more popular, the net asset value that they've reported, they have to report under statutory requirements under the companies that you have to report an interim and an annual re set of results. 
Yeah. It may not, the net asset value may be out of date. If you're reporting for a period ending in June, in say September, which is a typical time, okay, three months, in those three months, the net asset value might have changed and it might be out of date, the valuation they had before. So that might be a reason why apparent discount isn't really a discount or isn't really a premium. But the reason that people like me get involved in all these things is because we believe that actually that does create an opportunity. You can buy something at a discount. And if there's a reason why it will go back to trading at net asset value or above, at par, as we say, then you get a kind of double whammy return. You get the effect of the increase in the assets, and you also get an extra uplift from the fact that the discount is gone from a discount to back to par or to a premium. So yeah. if you have paid 80p for something which the net asset value of a pound and the net asset value goes up to say 120 and at the same time the discount narrows okay from back to par you've gone from paying 80p the net asset value has only gone up by 20p the share price has gone up by 40p that's uh, what we're all looking for we're looking for those nice uh, double whammies uh, where we get to both net asset value gain and the discount narrowing as part of it and of course you want to avoid the opposite where it goes the other way the net asset value, if you were investing in a trust, which only invests in other listed equities, they just take every morning, they just look at all the things they own and they look at the share, current share prices. And then they announce that day, what the net asset value is taking that uh, particular mm. valuation at say close of play yesterday, they will put that up in this morning as saying, this is the net asset value because it's, they're traded and therefore they're worth whatever the market's prepared to yeah. pay for them. Yeah. If you are investing in, as I said, in wind farms or something like that. A little bit harder to price. <laughs> can't price them every day. Exactly. Yeah. And indeed, there's no way of actually knowing what the value of some of these things is. A large industrial warehouse, for example, what is it really worth? The only way you can find out is by selling it. And obviously you don't want to sell your industrial warehouse every day because that would yeah. be really stupid. So you have to value it on some kind of basis. You have the professional valuers who come in and value it properly just as they would a house or else. But there's an element of, of subjectivity in that. And if economic conditions change, as they have done this year, you've seen interest rates rising, that has a direct impact on the valuations of many of the kind of things that investment trusts invest in. And we've actually seen that happen this year. Yeah. Are there any tax benefits to owning investment trusts? There are no particular tax benefits for investors in investment trusts relative to investors in unit trusts. The whole reason why these funds exist is because they are allowed to buy and sell things that they have in their fund without generating capital gains tax. It's their professional business is to buy and sell shares. So they are allowed to avoid paying capital gains tax when they buy and sell other shares. Yeah. That's only within the fund though. When they actually pay out that money to investors, they pay dividend and those are taxable in the, in the normal, normal way. Yeah. Okay. Understood. Unless you are, there's some exceptions to that, but basically venture capital trusts and things that have special rules, but yeah. basically they the investor has to pay tax when they receive income or also when they sell their shares in the investment trust, they may be liable to capital gains tax. Yeah. Of course, most investors nowadays put this in a, in a what we call a tax wrapper inside an ISA yeah. or maybe into a SIP, a self-invested personal pension, and that you don't have to pay income tax or capital gains as the shareholder either yeah, yeah. in those circumstances. But if you, if not, then you do have to pay tax, but the fund itself, the trust itself, like similarly for both investment trusts and open-ended funds, they can buy and sell things within the fund without paying tax. Understood. Getting back to when you mentioned that a trust goes from 80 pence rises up to £1.20, what sort of metrics do you look for then when you're looking to sell part of your or all of your investment and investment trust? That's a very good question and a difficult one to answer. It goes back to this idea of what are you actually trying to achieve? with your investment. For a lot of people, they just this is their savings for the future. They may not be very active in buying and selling investment trusts. They may just want to have exposure to that particular asset class and have their money looked after by a professional fund manager. If that's the case, then say you, you know, you're building a pension and you're going to own these, your portfolio for 20 years or something. There's quite a good argument for saying you shouldn't really do a lot of buying and selling yeah. because over time, whether it's a discount or a premium, it's going to even out at some point. Yeah. So the longer you own something, the less important the difference in the discount when you buy it and what price you can get when you might eventually sell it, it becomes less and less important. So that's one strategy is just as sort a of buy and hold it for a long period of time. But there are lots of investors who want to be a bit more active than that. But the fundamental then is, has something changed? Two questions, actually. Has something changed, first of all, with the trust that I'm already owning? And that might not be not just the price, but it might be the managers leaving. So Terry Smith, if it was Terry Smith, he might have retired, whatever. 
And then you've got some new person who's come in who may not be so experienced and may not do such a good job. That would be one reason you might think about selling. Another reason might be, obviously, if you have personal circumstances and so on. But Or you might want to switch from having so much in equities to having more in more defensive assets like commercial property or some of these alternative assets that mainly pay a dividend. Yeah. So that's one thing. And then the second thing is, are there better alternatives? So if, if have you got a chance to repeat that 80 to 120 P exercise, you've bought this thing successfully, 80 P it's gone to 120, uh, or even higher, maybe at a premium now, maybe selling yeah. a bad value, you've made a very nice gain. Should you actually lock that in? If there's another alternative where you have a chance to do the same thing again in a different type of investment trust, then sure. You only might want to switch from or switch part of your set you're holding anyway. Yeah. and go for the next one that's the sort of uh, the kind of dynamic there but a lot depends on to say what you're what you're trying to achieve and the, the evidence is that most private investors do far too much trading these opportunities are there and if you're very hard working and work very hard in your portfolio in the investment trust world you can get those opportunities to make extra money and you should take them but for most people i think they do too much of that and uh, it's quite difficult to get it right yeah, the selling part is equally as hard as the buying part, isn't it? It's uh, yeah, harder in a way. Yeah, harder. Yeah, it's yeah. Very so you're reluctant to, to cash something in. But if you think about it, why would uh, investment trust trade at a premium? That's because the number of shares available is fixed, as I've said. Well, almost fixed. I'll come back to that point. And, <laughs> uh, and there's more demand than uh, maybe a hot area like technology was after the pandemic. Technology trusts took off because we all went and we all know about that story. Yeah. And they, there was so much demand for them because they were doing so well that the shares went to a big premium and then the thing burst. And it always over time probably will. There are very few cases where premiums are persistent. There used to be in the old days before the rules changed back at the turn of the century. Some investment trusts did trade at a premium permanently. Mm -hmm. So you had to pay above the odds to get into the, the supply and demand issue. But since 1999, when they changed the rules, if their shares are trading at a premium, they can issue more shares. I did say that fixed, in theory, the whole idea about investment trust is that the number of shares in issue is fixed, and therefore it's all about supply and demand amongst investors, whether the shares do well or not. But now that they can issue shares, and a lot of them do, they're effectively growing the size of the investment trust by issuing new shares. So suppose you have a trust which is trading at £1.20 and the net asset value is a pound. Okay, so it's trading at a premium of 20%, mm. 20 versus 100 Okay, they can then go back to the market and say, look, there's obviously more demand than supply here. Otherwise, we wouldn't have this premium. Let's issue some more shares until we get rid of that premium. Uh -huh. So basically that happens now because in the long run, what's the best thing for an investor trust to do? Is it to actually trade at a premium all the time and therefore deter new investors coming in? Or should it outgrow the size of the trust? So the difference between investor trust and open-ended trust is not as great as it used to be because investor trusts do have the ability now to issue new shares when they're trading at a premium effectively without having to go through the whole rigmarole of doing a formal fundraising like a placing or something which requires a prospectus and brokers to be paid fees and things. So that has introduced a greater flexibility into the investment trust world. And so you don't see quite as many trusts trading at, at big premiums for long periods of time. So by saying that actually over time, you probably don't want to stick with trusts that are trading at big premium. Yeah. Things may change as well. We saw that early this year with the renewable energy trusts, for example, all of which were trading at a big premium between typically between sort of six, eight, 10, even 15, 20% in some cases. What changed? The war in Ukraine changed, first of all. So that was positive. Energy prices went up. They did better because of the way that they get funded and how much money they make from renewable energy. But then the government introduced the windfall tax in the last statement. And so they've all now gone back to, or nearly all of them gone back to trading at a discount. Right. So that's kind of external event that can change the whole dynamics of a particular sector. And so those premiums have disappeared for the time being, at least anyway. If, if a trust is trading at a discount, is there a specific point where you'll say, yeah, I need to get out of this. This is time to, to cut my losses here. It depends what it is, I think. And it depends why you bought it in the first place. If something has changed that says that basically the story that you thought you were buying into has changed, then you should seriously think about, about selling. If on the other hand, you think that it's just a kind of passing fad and the markets, markets move in mysterious ways, we know. <laughs> Buy and demand moves. There's a lot of herd like behavior. If somebody says, get out of technology, there'll be lots of people get out of technology at the same time. Yeah. And that drives the share price for discount. But you might then think, okay, that's overdone. Therefore, I'm going to buy some more. I'm just going to sit tight and see what, what happens. Yeah. So it does depend a little bit on, on what the circumstances are. And, but to give you another example, recently we had in number of trusts invest in social housing, which is uh, providing 
accommodation, which is a very good thing. They're providing accommodation for either homeless people or for people who need care, full-time care, and so on. So we, three of those have come to the market in the last two or three years. But there, uh, we've had what we rather unfortunate episode where two of these trusts have been effectively, uh, say, attacked is a rather dramatic word saying, but they've been attacked by what we call short sellers. In other words, mm -hmm. these are hedge funds who think that they found a flaw in the way that the trust, either the business model or the way that it's being managed, and they go public with this, that initially tends to lead to a negative share price reaction. So these particular trusts, they were trading at a premium, they've now all gone to a discount right. uh, because of this short selling attack. And then if that happens, you can look into the allegations that have been made against them. The board responds and says, you know, what these guys are saying is wrong. Yeah. We are doing this, blah, blah, blah. But sometimes there are some real issues there. And experience is if you don't know how to judge whether the issue is right or not, you can read what the short sellers are saying. You can read what the board says in reply. But if you don't really know what, understand how this works and in social housing, it's quite complicated. Who are they dealing with the housing associations, their regulator, what does the regulator say, blah, blah then experience suggests that the best thing to do is to sell straight away with ask questions later. So the first cut is the hardest is what we always say in the city. So if something goes wrong, the shares sell off, but they never sell off quite as far as they eventually sell off. Yeah. So if you get out quickly, you're minimizing your loss, basically, yeah. even if it's painful to do that. So yeah. that does happen. Not very often, I hasten to add, but uh, that would be an example of where, yes, you should be selling if the shares go to a discount. Yeah. In the normal course of things, there's one other factor I should mention, which is that Again, these days, I mentioned that investor trusts can issue shares when their shares are trading at a premium. They can also, subject to shareholder approval, they have they can buy back their shares if they're trading at a discount. So what that happens is the board goes out and says, look, we think this is ridiculous, this discount, or it's overdone. So we're going to buy, go into the market, and we're going to create some more demand, effectively, buying back the shares that we've issued. And a number of boards, about 50 out of 300 or so, have what's called discount control mechanisms, where they actually say to the market, we are going to buy back shares if the discount reaches 5% or if it reaches 10% or mm -hmm. something like that. And if, as long as they're true to their word and actually do that, then if the shares go to a 10% discount, you'd think on the face of it, it's relatively safe to buy them. If you like, if you like what they're doing, because the board is going to come in and buy back some shares and keep that discount at 10%. So the discount risk the risk of the discount getting wider, which would cost you money, is effectively reduced or indeed eliminated in some cases. Yeah, it's very much the same as when you're looking to purchase individual stocks, isn't it? There's a lot of due diligence involved, isn't there? Well, there should be. People just buy it on the strength of, of either they... Re, re, they discount they, or a premium. Yeah, discount or premium, or they read something in the newspaper or they're on the new, on a platform or something, or they're just buying it because it's going up, which is the worst thing of all, yeah. of course, you buy because it's going up. You don't quite know why you're buying it, but everybody else is doing it. And it seems to be technology just a classic example, a biotech during, after the pand pandemic as well, similar example. Some of the share prices there went up by a hundred percent in right. about a year, which is, that's not normal. <laughs> that's yeah, not yeah. That is not normal. People tend to get very excited. They say, oh my God, the pandemic, we've got the vaccines, everything's going to go different. We're all going to go stay at home forever. Of course, it doesn't work like that. But in the short term, everybody piles into the same thing. That drives the shares up to a very high level, 100% gain in a year. If you ever experience one of those, you should be asking yourself, is this too good to be true? And the answer yeah. is always too good to be true. So you should be thinking about reducing or selling or waiting for it to come back to more normal levels. But yeah, that does happen a lot, I'm afraid. So people do buy it for the wrong reasons. And that's one of the great issues around investment. If it does require a lot of work or a lot of experience or knowing people or reading about stuff that who you think actually do know what they're talking about and yeah. therefore you can, to some extent, rely on what they do. But ultimately, it is down to you, always down to you, whether you get it right or not. Yeah. As I said earlier on in the introduction, clearly your experience immense. you've been involved in the markets for a lot of decades. You've got the book, the Investment Trust Handbook, which is now on its sixth edition. You've also got the Money Makers podcast, and you've got the uh, Money Makers member circle. Would you mind sharing with the audience what the book is about, the podcast, and how they can connect with you and learn from you and benefit from your experience as well? Yes, let's, let's balloon a little bit. All these things tie together, the, the podcast, the subscription newsletter, and the, and the annual handbook. They all tie together um, because I'm interested in investment trusts. I'm very fortunate. I, as you say, I've been around a long time. I know quite a lot of, of people I, because I've been in the media for a number of years as well. I get access to some things that aren't generally available to the general public because of regulators' insistence, not for any other reason. I guess to that extent, I'm in a privileged position. 
And I just decided a few years ago, not so long ago, actually, that I wanted to share that with other people. So the handbook, the Investment Trust handbook, I like to call it the wisdom of the Investment Trust world, but it's basically just an annual record, a chunky volume you can look at every year with lots of articles and data about what's happened mm -hmm. in the Investment Trust world. So it's a reference book, if you like, and it includes a lot of data that you just can't get elsewhere. There are more places now where you can get that information, but it's in a, presented in a I hope a readable way. Yeah. And there's lots of articles explaining what's happened and discussing ideas and things. So I started that because I thought that there was a gap in the market for that. And I wanted to try and share some of my knowledge and some of the access I have with a broader audience. And then on the back of that, then during the pandemic, I started this podcast because we had the very sharp market sell-off and the investment trust has widened dramatically right across the industry. And I thought it was important then to let people know what was happening and why, and talk about, talk about investment trusts in a, in an accessible way. Yeah. But the great thing about them is that because they're listed companies, if you're in a unit trust, you might. You might hear from them once a year. You might not hear from them at all because they may issue an annual report, but they're not obliged to send it to you. Nothing much happens. You just leave it and occasionally look at the price or something. And you, they do produce reports, but you have to look for them. Whereas the investment trust, because they're public listed companies, they have to produce interim and annual results. As I've said, they have to publish in net asset values on a regular basis. They have to announce to the market when they're doing things, if something has changed or something big, important has happened. So every week there's a huge amount of news about investment trusts that you just don't get in the yeah. unit. And so that becomes then a talking point. And the idea of the podcast is to talk through all the things that have been said that week, try and pick out the ones that are most interesting and talk about them with, with an expert. So another expert. So we have a kind of dialogue with, yeah. with other people who follow investment trust professionally. And then the subscription newsletter just provides a lot of data and information behind a very modest paywall, I should say, two yeah. pounds a week for people who want to find out even more. Yeah. So we have a list of all the, uh, all the announcements that week, you can go and actually look at the announcements directly. We provide the links for you. Don't have to go looking for them yourself. We provide summary of the biggest movers over the week and over the year to date. And I write some stuff and then some other colleagues of mine write up trust profiles and so on. So there's a lot of stuff out there to write about in investment trusts. And that's the kind of market I'm trying to fulfill as investor trusts are becoming more popular with retail investors, private investors, mainly because platforms now allow them to access yeah. them very easily and find out more information about them. So it's been fun. I mean, basically it's, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun and get a lot of feedback, positive feedback. I'm happy to say, and I don't know how long I've gone doing it, but I'm going to keep plugging away for a while. Yeah. You get a lot of pleasure from helping people, don't you? Sharing what knowledge you've gained over these years and seeing the benefits when people share a nice comment, send a nice email in, it makes it all worthwhile, doesn't it? It does. It, you could say I've been pretty dumb about this because I've what I wanted to do when I started the handbook and what I wanted to do with everything I do is I wanted to provide something that was genuinely independent. And mm -hmm. if you look around the financial services industry and in investment world in particular, very hard to find genuinely independent and commentary. The newspapers do a job and that's absolutely fine. Though they do take advertisements, it doesn't really influence the content, but they, that's just a fact commercially. A lot of the platforms have a conflict of interest, essentially. A lot of the research you can read about investment trust is basically funded by the companies. So you've got to be quite careful. There isn't a lot of genuinely in independent educational material about investment trusts out there. And I guess if I wanted to, I was being more commercial, I would take adverts, I would uh, do sponsorship, and I would uh, charge even more money for what I do charge people for the newsletter. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't really where I started it, why I started it. And so I've stuck with that. And no doubt I could have made a lot more money doing it differently. But as I say, I get the satisfaction out of doing it. And I hope helping people with their decisions. Yeah. Brilliant. And I will make sure that all those links are in the show notes below. So the link to the investment trust handbook, a link to your podcast, any social media accounts, Twitter. Yeah, we're on Twitter. Yep. Yep. I will add that, that link in as well. And LinkedIn, you can find us, you can find me there. You can't find Moneymakers. You can find me there on Twitter. You can find Moneymakers. Yeah. Going back in the day, the city's best kept secret. And it Isn't was, it really was like that. Not always. There was one or two of them, Foreign Colonial, for example, and Alliance Trust. They had mm. uh, quite big retail followings back in the, back in the, what we, I suppose you call the bad old days. <laughs> but it was a very different world then. A lot of pension funds and insurance companies own investment trusts rather than managing their own stock and bond portfolios, which they do now. Yeah. They all, they just use the investment trust to do that, but they've basically all disappeared. So the only people who invest in trust now, are, broadly speaking, with some exceptions, private investors and what we call wealth managers, which you can describe as old fashioned stockbrokers who now call themselves wealth managers, <laughs> not always correctly. They, so these are firms that actually manage private client money. They like investment trusts because they also know that they are actually very good vehicles for getting access to things. And in particular, these new breed or alternative, what we call alternative asset 
investment trusts. We have seen some very interesting newcomers come to the market, which is and now about half the investment trusts that are out there are alternative assets. So that's private equity, commercial property, renewable energy, I mentioned infrastructure. We have a, a couple of funds that invest in music royalties. We have shipping, a couple of shipping investment trusts and so on. And they become more and more popular because mainly because they've been selling on dividend yield yeah. ground. So they offer, they've been offering between five, six, 7% per annum. That's good. Yeah. With the prospect of some additional capital growth as well, which is obviously much better than the bank account has been or government bonds have been yeah. until this year anyway. Yeah. But again, thank you very much for having me on. It's been a pleasure. I always like talking about investment trusts. So, yeah. you know, there's always another opportunity to do that. And they're not perfect. I hasten to add, I should have mentioned that. They're not perfect investment trusts. There's some good ones and bad ones. Uh, but the good ones are very good and the bad ones hopefully you'll be able to to avoid but it does require a little bit of effort but i can assure you it's well worth the effort if you actually you have the time and the inclination to put it in brilliant thanks jonathan take care well thank you for listening to the fund your retirement podcast if you'd like to hear more conversations like this from experts in the field of finance and wealth building strategies then please subscribe for future episodes thank you and have a great day